Greetings, travelers. It's time for me to once again summarize not the next big story arc of Final Fantasy XIV. I will get there eventually. However, I do think there are a couple of side quests and mandatory quests that I should cover in the meantime in order to build up to yet another extremely large project. I do not want to set your expectations sky high, so I'm only planning on covering Bahamut and the Crystal Tower for now. I will however use some spoiler references all the way through to Shadowbringers, just in case you haven't watched my whole series up until this point. Insert channel plug here. I'm just going to start writing this script. So let's all get back on the nostalgia train and return to the waking sands. And I thought I was stupid for holding on to these Aetherite tickets on my alt. I'm also going to have to add another side note here real quick. I was trying to rewatch some cutscenes on my main, only to find out that some of the early cutscenes I couldn't rewatch or it was listed somewhere completely differently from where I expected. So instead, in order to get a few clips, I had to use yet another alternative character, which is a gunbreaker. That doesn't look like my main at all. So if you see this character in any of these cutscenes, just imagine that it is a purple-haired samurai cat girl and everything will be fine. We're gonna need to get ourselves in the correct headspace. So remember Ifrit, Titan, and Garuda? Remember A Realm Reborn? Yeah, we killed all those primals, we also defeated the ultimate weapon, and we returned to the Waking Sands, and we have heard of yet another big, yet unknown primal. So we need to go talk to the cooler Alphano. This is when we actually could really first get to know Alize before Heavensward. So anyways, when 1.0 was destroyed by the moon crashing into the planet, this caused the Aether of the planet to be very messed up and also created a bunch of caves. At least that is what we think. This is technically important to the entire setting of all the coil raids. Anyways, Alize and Alphano's grandfather fought against Bahamut back then by trying to seal Bahamut away, only for Bahamut to break free and then disappear. Hey, wait a minute, that happened twice? In more or less the exact same way? Nice. So Alize wants to find out what actually happened to her grandfather and by proxy, Bahamut. So we're going to need to explore the caves underneath Castrum, insert whatever name here. Seriously, Garlemald, can you use a different word like, I don't know, Strumcast? It would sound a little bit different. Wow, this place is very crystal-y. So at this point, I should probably make you aware the moon that crashed into the planet is made of a bunch of fancy technology. Ooh, this technology looks really familiar. Ah yes, it was created by the Alligans. It's always the fucking Alligans. It was created to seal Bahamut. Anyways, kill the ads. Boo. Boo. Those are some big chicken wings, says Alize. So yeah, Bahamut is just here. In this cave. Right now. Either dead, or asleep, or a zombie, I guess. Although primals usually dissolve into nothingness when they die, so either Bahamut is not a primal, or he is not dead. Take a wild guess. I sure hope someone isn't trying to sell me something right now. Well, that was easy enough. Let's take a little bit of a detour for the time that you farmed this raid a million times for an event on Blue Mage, and then take another detour through a pseudo-jumping puzzle to get into the engine room. And of course, another elevator fight, my favorite. Alizé decides to thank us for carrying her. Jesus Christ, Bahamut's hand is massive. Anyways, Alizé considers that it was in fact not Bahamut dissolving into Aether that caused the land to regenerate, but it must have actually been something else. I sure hope it was Twisters. Alright, with Twintania defeated, we have completed the first set of raids and we can now enter the Hub Zone. So it is kind of important to know that the Alligans invented shock collars that they could use to control the dragons, which is what we saw in Twintania. Likely the reason why the Garlic Empire is here is so that they could try to get that technology for themselves. Anyways, look, it's Bahamut's head. Since the head is pulsating, that means that Bahamut is alive. I guess that's how you tell that a primal is living. Just the, the pulsating. Okay then. Is that the salesman that we saw earlier? Yes, except it's actually Grandpa. Motherfucking Louis Swa is just here. Please ignore the other character in the background. Dishing out some more emotional trauma, I see. No wonder why the twins are so messed up. In spite of all this emotional distress, Alize concludes that both Grandpa and Bahamut are alive, which means nobody lost and nobody won five years ago. Don't fucking tell me to go back to that place. You know, I thought we moved the headquarters to Mordona. 
Nah, that didn't happen yet in the plot, but come on. Alizé decides that we do not know enough and to come back in the next patch of Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn. Now that we're back in the awake sands, time to hear what Udienja has to say. Ah, primal present detected, he says. Thanks, I already knew that. But now we are relatively sure that the area above Bahamut is still somewhat devoid of life thanks to the primal regenerating itself underground. Also, somewhat important note, the reason why Bahamut was the moon core for the Allegan moon satellite is because he can control a large amount of aether, and he was originally directing energy from sun rays into the crystal tower. You know, in hindsight, maybe I summarized these events in the wrong order. Anyways, these supposed binding coils that you see around Bahamut both trap him and also keep him alive. Yeah, that's how a prison works. Of course, if Bahamut is actually a primal, you typically need continuous source of prayer to keep the primal going. Yet no one alive that we know of worships Bahamut. Alizé speculates that this leads to the potential that the Allegans could simulate prayer power. But that's not really important. What is important to know is that by destroying all the coils, we will, in theory, kill Bahamut's life support once and for all. So we end up going to another dig site for another fragment of the Fallen Moon. This one was not being researched by the Garlic Empire, so have fun dealing with the exploration entirely by yourself. Oh hey, it's cute Alize. What are you doing here? You're here to let us know that your sister, Cool Alphano, is obsessed with Grandpa, and you hope that she doesn't try to save the supposed shade of him rather than save Eorzea itself. I guess that makes enough sense. Thanks for letting us know that you're involved in this plotline. So some rocks appear before us while walking. Alize mentions something about not letting her grandpa get away the next time that she sees him, and we manage to get to the entrance of the shard. Oh, I guess the Empire is here? Alright, who is this person? I'll give you a hint. It's the opposite of the Black Wolf. That's right, it's the White Raven who made the Meteor Project. Nail Von Darnis. Although that's the name of the person who used to inhabit that body. Instead, this tempered person is named... Nail Deus Darnus. Isn't that basically the same thing? Alright, see you later. Of course, Nail was also supposed to have been dead in that battle that happened five years ago, which is very surprising because we have seen zero other people in this subplot who were supposed to be dead. Not a single one. With that random boss out of the way, now what do we do? Go through the halls deeper and bounce around a bunch? Eh, this arena is pretty sick though. Oh look, it's the moon! Why is this so small? I see, this is where the original Nail died. Good thing that Nail is here to kill us for disturbing the grave of Nail. So when Nail died, that's when Nail was born. I definitely have kept track of these character names between past and present Nail. Except old Nail was a man and new Nail is a woman. Alright, it's time for the ultimate can you solo this fight unsynced challenge. After that supreme ass kicking, it appears that Nail is still around. Oh shit, this is the old nail, not the new nail, speaking through the body of new nail. Yeah, that makes sense. So nail did go under the influence of a primal. Ironic. Alize demands to learn what nail knows about her grandfather, to which nail says you will learn in time going down the path that you're currently on, but just know that it's nothing good. I'm going to go out on a limb here, I don't think we're going to be able to chat anymore. Good thing that that random bolt didn't hit a beloved character out of nowhere, that would be very random and also very underwhelming. On the way to disable the coil, Alize mentions that she didn't think that we would actually defeat Nail. I mean, her grandpa was thought to be invincible and look what happened to him. He's only fucking immortal. Oh damn, Louis Swa ain't fucking around. Don't break the coils, he says. No, says Alize. No way, you're telling me that this Louis Swa is tempered by Bahamut as well? I am so shocked right now, you can hear it in my voice. Alize declares that she will avenge the memory of her grandfather and kill Bahamut once and for all, so we're gonna go back to the Waking Sands now. Udianger says that this is probably making Alize go through too much emotional trauma, to which she says that she can handle it. And in case you couldn't figure it out for yourself, Udianger will summarize it for you. Nail, as in the old Nail, was the one who originally made a way to contact the moon, which is probably what originally awoke in Bahamut and is also what ended up tempering Nail. Alize simply ponders if there are more servants of Bahamut around other than the ones that we have met so far. Oh look, Alize simply wants to fight on her grandfather's behalf and has no other motivation so far. This is also very unexpected, but I guess Alphano is okay with this. Alright, so we know where the last two things to disable are located. We just don't know how to break into them. 
So I guess we can try to figure that out. Hello, other person that will tell me that we still don't know how to break in. It turns out that his brother is in trouble, though, so we should probably help him. Alright, so we save him, and the brother tells us that we still don't know how to get into the fragment. Yo, can the plot tell me this at least one more time? I'm not so sure that I know that we can't gain access to the other coils yet. Thank you, Urienje. So essentially, we can just use the place that we popped out the first time to get into the other coils by using it in reverse. But this might kill us. That's neat. Alize mentions that Udienger had some help doing this, to which he says, Yes, but I'm not going to tell you who it was. It was Alphano, of course. And they have a peaceful and relaxing discussion about pure versus impure motivations, with no shouting involved whatsoever. Alphano mentions that Alize is doing this because she believes her grandfather would have wanted her to, which is not a good enough motivation to save the fucking universe. But anyways, that's not important right now because we're going to have to stop Bahamut from regenerating. Time to go into the final coils. We managed to teleport to the correct place without dying. Who could have seen that coming? Time to fuck some shit up again. I'm sure that this boss is going to be super cool and super chimerical. Ooh, look at all those dragons. So, you know, this kind of brings us back to the original question. Who or what is keeping Bahamut alive with all the prayer power? Alizé originally thought that the Alligans somehow created artificial prayer, but that doesn't seem right. In fact, now that I think about it, all these imprisoned dragons are obviously the source at this point. So to kind of put it in perspective, the Alligans imprisoned all of these dragons of Eld so that they can continuously summon Bahamut by keeping them in a state of perpetual duress. And also imprison Bahamut at the same time. You know, this is all pretty fucking metal, so let's keep moving forward. I love the Death Star. Nothing important happens on the way or during this boss fight. Afterwards, though, the team realizes that this Death Star is actually a model of Dalamud. You know, the moon that crashed that I've only talked about a thousand times now. This somehow gives us an idea of how angry Bahamut must be, but Alize claims that she's even angrier than Bahamut. Oh damn, Bahamut is getting more and more put together already. Oh, look who's here to stop us. Let's hear about some backstory. So the Alligans invaded the dragons, which caused the dragons to summon Bahamut, which ultimately only made the Alligans capture Bahamut and causing the Alligans to become even more powerful. Louis Zwa mentions that he summoned the Twelve when he was faced with a calamity. And really, how is he held in high regard for his sacrifice and yet the dragons who summoned their primal were held in contempt? We would all do the same thing when faced with extinction. So somehow this means the solution to the current problem is to kill every single person in existence. You know, that doesn't really make any sense at all. Alizé says that her grandfather always believed in his people to overcome such hardships, which of course, the Shade says was not actually true. Alphano said something about them being judged poorly by their grandpa in the moment, but that doesn't really matter. He wonders if Louis Wall only says these things about humanity because he is no longer human. And of course, Louis Wall says that you can find out what he truly wished for. And he turns into a phoenix and runs away. Nah, just kidding. We get to fight him. <clears throat> Final coil of Bahamut, turn three, fountain of fire prog. And then we defeat the phoenix, proving that Louis Swa did in fact turn into a primal. So anyways, look, it's the real grandpa, free of Bahamut's control. I guess this is a good reunion. Alphano apologizes for calling his grandpa a primal, but he does say that that's what he is. So of course, we still have an important question to ask. What actually happened during the Calamity? So during the Empire Invasion, Bahamut was released when the moon crashed into the planet, and Grandpa called upon the power of the Twelve to help him. But that amount of power was not even close to how much he actually needed. So he decided to use the last of his strength and sacrifice his life to prepare for the future instead. I hope you're ready for that really anime cutscene, which I'm not going to play in its entirety, but it's a good one. I promise, I recommend you look it up yourself. So he sacrifices himself to destroy Bahamut, but as you can see, there is still untold destruction. Although fortunately, this left a massive cloud of Aether in the aftermath. After breaking both the cage that Louis Swa originally summoned to try to contain Bahamut, and also blowing Bahamut the fuck up. All this Aether then responded to both Grandpa and everyone else's wish for the realm to be saved, turning him into a primal. More precisely, a phoenix, which is what ultimately gave life back to the land. However, as his power as the phoenix decayed, he was tempered by Bahamut and they both went down together. This is why Eorzea is somewhat unevenly rejuvenated, as some of the Aether was eaten up by Bahamut's small remains to try to put himself back together in the last moments before he truly died. 
Although he was mostly shattered, the coils will always seek out whatever remains of Bahamut and put him back together, which is the actual reason for why there is this massive network of tunnels to try to find Bahamut's heart. So in other words, throw out all that information that the twins speculated on earlier. Thus, Louis Swa, before he goes, tells us to defeat Bahamut forever. He also tells the twins to find their own reason to fight and to not just use his. Alphano knows what he wants to do, but Alize has yet to find her own strength. Although Grandpa isn't a full primal, he gives what strength he has left to his grandchildren, and what is ultimately his final goodbye. And now, we finish this. Oh wait a minute, Bahamut can fight back a little, despite not being whole. Well that looked like it hurt. It looks like Alize finally found her reason to fight. Time for Alize to go even further beyond. That's right, block that attack with the shield of magic that I don't know what it is. Alphano decides to also help in this moment for once in his life. Oh, would you look at that, I never knew that books could fly around like that. In fact, you could put two books together and make a big book. Alright, let's fucking do this. You tell them, Alize. It's time to fight for the future. Welcome to Bahamut, but for real this time. Terra Flare is a sick animation and the music in this instance is honestly awesome. And it's over. Well, it's good to be back. That's what a dead Bahamut looks like. If only a certain someone would just type on the keyboard first. Damn, that is a lot of aether by the looks of it. Good thing we also freed all those trapped dragons too. Right? Alize speculates that Alphano knew the entire time that Louis Swa turned into a primal, and he was worried that she would become tempered. Alphano simply says that it was a lucky guess. But now all three of us know the truth about the calamity. Alize chooses to not share with the rest of the world that they were ultimately brought back by a primal, because that knowledge might make people want to summon a primal again, despite already knowing that long-term summoning primals doesn't work. So everyone just ultimately agrees there are some things the world is better left not knowing. So we return to Udianger while looking like we just got blown up. Of course the twins are actually okay since it appears that Grandpa healed them before he left. So Alphano wants to go and tell everyone that this newest primal threat has been taken care of. This threat might even be bigger than that of Good King Mugglemog. Alize says that she wants to help in diplomacy, which is odd. But this ends with Alize saying that her and Alphano, despite going on different paths, are ultimately going to try to accomplish the same thing. Yeah, it'd be really weird if you two worked together. Of course, we go back to look at the moon fragments that crash into the planet, which are obviously still there, and will be forever. You know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Alize mentions something about us never getting credit for being a hero, as if the Warrior of Light cares about that at all. Alize then throws a flower into the wind to mourn the loss of her grandfather, and the dragons, and also everyone who ultimately sacrificed themselves to save the realm. She then says that she will do something off-screen until she's needed in the actual MSQ, and that's it. That's the end of the Bahamut story. So it's not super duper long, but now you at least know where Alize got her moment to shine and stand up against all the odds. You also get to know a little bit more about the most recent calamity and the people who tried to stop it, because 1.0 doesn't exist anymore. Louis Swa is an important character, I swear. And so is Nail. We all remember Nail very, very well. As for the stuff that you might need to know in summary, the artificial moon created by the Alligans that crashed into Eorzea was a prison for Bahamut. Nail from the Garlean Empire communicated with that moon in the first place, which is what caused the moon crashing calamity. Louis Swa fought against Bahamut and defeated him while also turning into a primal to do so. And this means that Eorzea was reborn thanks to the Phoenix, and nobody knows this fact. And Alize found her reason to fight, which is to get you, the Warrior of Light, to do all the heavy lifting. So with that, I guess I have to cover another side story after this, and then I will get to do my Endwalker video at some point in the future. I'm not going to give you a timeline for that. But do I personally like the Bahamut story? Yeah, mostly. I think the end is the coolest part, to be honest. I think it's a little bit better if it's where you first meet Alize. Now let's get out there and remember where the original Fountain of Fire mechanic came from.